Sex is an important part of marriage. Today, we are answering your questions about sex. We polled everyone on Instagram to see what questions you have about sex, and today we're going to spend some time answering them. If you are new to the Awesome Marriage Podcast, we drop a new episode every Tuesday, and on the last Tuesday of every month, it's a special guest interview. Be sure to hit subscribe so that you can tune in each and every week. So, Dr. Kim, just going to rapid fire these questions off at you. Are you ready? I'm ready. Ready to go. talk about sex. Here we go. So the first question is, what do I do? What do you do if your sex drive is completely gone, but your spouse's isn't? We, I, I think the worst thing you can do is just accept that's that's the way it is. It's got to be something that you work on and you work on together. I uh, Maybe last year I had a couple. It was really a pretty good example of that because he had tried to talk about it. her sex drive was not there, uh, but she wouldn't respond. She wouldn't listen to him. She wouldn't talk. He had an affair. That's not an excuse to have an affair, but... Uh, they didn't deal with it. And then they did deal with it later on in counseling. And we work. And the thing is, we were able to work on some things and work that work that out. Because I think a lot of times if Steph drive is gone, why is it gone? Do we need to figure out why is it gone? Is there something medically there? Is it something that's happened in the relationship? Is it just hormonal? You know, what is it like that? Um, and I've had, I had one wife one time that was astounded that her husband had an affair because she said, I just didn't think sex was important to him anymore. Mm. And, and so, so she didn't, you know, she didn't have a drive, so she didn't. So I think we make some assumptions there that causes problems. And so my answer to that would be if the drive is gone, the spouse's isn't, uh, do something about it. Mm-hmm. Get it, get on the table, talk about it, begin to take steps, make, find out what you need to do. Maybe a Christian counselor would be a good start. Cause I, you know, what I would do was direct somebody, okay, let's check out everything medically, you know, make an appointment here and there, what's a guy or woman, whatever it is, and, and get those things tested, hormones and stuff like that. And then talk about their sex life. What, when was it good? What happened between now and then? Uh, how do we get it back to where it was and try to help yeah. them both see the value in it you know, and, and today with, with, uh, medications like Viagra mm-hmm. and Cialis and stuff like that, people have sex life all the way through their, their married life where it was, I think a time years ago where people kind of gave up at a certain time because it just wasn't physically, it wasn't as easy that happened now. And so I think it, when you see sex as this gift from God that you want to enjoy it as long as you can. Yeah. that's good. And in most marriages, the wife is, husband's probably going to have a stronger drive than the wife usually. Yeah. 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 But there's definitely the exceptions to that. There are sections. That that was such an interesting story that you shared. It reminded me um, that like so often it's just like we don't talk about it. Right. Exactly. So like, she, like she thought that he was done with sex too. Cause she didn't have a drive, but like he didn't bring it up with her. He didn't yep. talk to her about it. They didn't talk about it. She didn't check in with him and he didn't check in with her. And so that's so fascinating. A couple of years ago, Dylan and I were ministering to this couple where it was a reverse situation. So he had completely lost his sex drive. Um, and she would bring it up, but like so sporadically and she got so fed up with him, but it's like, she'd bring it up twice a year. And mm-hmm. she said, this isn't really important to me. And so they'd have more sex for about a month, but then they'd like slip off the bandwagon and then she'd be so irritated, but she wouldn't communicate to him Yeah, and she wouldn't initiate. And so it was just really, co- so like moral of the story, talk to each other. Talk to each other. Absolutely. And, you know, I think if you talk to each other and figure out some things, I think you can make sex where it's enjoyable. You know, I, I know some couples where the wife may not orgasm as much as she gets older, but I've, I've had those women tell me, but I still enjoy it. I still enjoy mm-hmm. the closeness. If I don't orgasm them every time, I still enjoy being close to him. And it is something that I thoroughly enjoy. Yeah, definitely. Sex is a lot more than just the physical, like, yeah. you know, orgasm. It's yeah. so much more than that. And so don't give up on this really important part um, of your marriage. I think another piece of advice would be like remembering that you have to get there mentally before you can get there physically. And for some people in certain seasons or as you age, like it's just going to take more time to get there mentally, but like work at it, pray about it and like, think about it, think about your spouse and like gear yourself up mentally before the physical thing. I think that can help a lot. Um, and yeah, pray and ask God to give you the desire for sex again. Yeah. And I think it's, it's good sometimes to go back and, and relive with your spouse, talk about some sexual experiences in the past, uh, during your life. And sometimes that will kind of stimulate. Yeah, that really was good. Why? I don't want to give that up. Let's yeah. work on it, you know? Yeah. And, and like you, Dr. Kim mentioned with the, the medications and seeing a doctor, like go see a doctor about it. Like, don't be nervous to talk about this. Doctors hear like Absolutely. this all the time. Um, and this isn't like, 
an issue that's unique to you. A lot of people, like you're so not alone. A lot of people have this issue. And so talking to a doctor about it can really help. Absolutely. And the doctor's not going to think anything of you. No. And if you have a doctor you're not comfortable with, say you're a woman and you're OB as a, a man, switch to a woman OB if you feel more comfortable. Absolutely. But don't just let that be a barrier for you. Do whatever it takes to get in front of a doctor that can really help you see if there's anything wrong there. Same with, okay, with a guy and a urologist. Is, is there something needs to be done to help you? Yeah, that's good. Uh, so similar question. Uh, how do you regain the sexual energy in your marriage if you've lost it? I think you've, I, I usually have couples look at what worked in the past. Okay. What was going on then? Uh, and then, okay, would that work now or would a form of that work now? And again, it's, it's working on it together. I think you can use that. You know, I talk off and on about the book celebration of sex and it's, it's a illustrated. It's been out probably 15 years now, but it's really good. And I think a lot of times couples look at it. It's a Christian it's not weird. Okay. It's, a, it's not weird. It's not actual people. It's drawings and stuff like that. And so, but I think you, you can kind of stimulate again. Okay. Well, why don't we try that? We never did try that maybe. And so you're working on it together and you're figuring out some things that, that might put um, a spark back in. Yeah. That's good. That's good advice. Yeah. I think um, if you've lost your sexual energy in marriage, I guess I, I would have like a lot of follow up questions like what's going on outside the bedroom. Yeah. Um, I think that's something you have to think about. Like, are you guys close? Are you connected? Are you having fun together? So I think doing things outside the bedroom can certainly help things inside the bedroom. I'd, I'd say it, it absolutely does. And so starting a weekly date night could help if you're not already doing that so that you're having fun together and connecting on a regular basis. Um, also, like just trying new ways to romance your spouse, like in and giving that emotional intimacy that will lead to physical intimacy or improve physical intimacy, um, writing them sweet notes, um, surprising them unexpectedly, planning a weekend getaway, um, things like that, I think can really help. Absolutely. I think all those are really good. You know, one of the things we talk about is 24 7, 365 foreplay. And basic principles that do something good for your spouse every day. And when you do that, I think when you're having fun with your spouse, you're communicating well, you're resolving conflict. It really opens the door for sex to be really, really good because you don't have a bunch of constraints holding on to keeping you back there. And I think too, guys, you have to continue to be romantic. And I think that is something that as guys, we get very lazy about. We do it well when we're pursuing her. You know, I, I had a guy that he, in his proposal, he had uh, rose petals from a parking lot in a church all the way up the sidewalk, all the way down the altar to where he was at the top to propose to her. You know, he didn't buy her a rose again for 10 years till they came into counseling. You know, I mean, it's, seriously, you've got to continue to do things that are romantic because your wife loves it. She is Juliet, no matter what you think. And you got to figure out how to be her Romeo. Yeah, that's cute. Um, so next question, what sex frequency is normal? Uh, two and three quarter. No. <laughs> yeah, I always wonder when somebody would say two and a half times. I thought, well, how do you do the half time? I never figured <laughs> that out. That just didn't make sense. But, but I think that we asked the wrong question. It's not what is normal. It's what's your normal. What season are the two of you in? What works for both of you? There were seasons in our marriage where before we had kids that, you know, a normal might be four or five times a week. Then you got kids and you're tired and it was like, okay, we were working to where we tried to make that twice a week. And maybe there's time, you know, when somebody's going through a uh, depression or something like that, that we just, you know, we're just going to back off for a while until we get to that point. So I think it's got to be what is normal for the two of you and to decide that you've got to communicate on it. And you've got to look at all the variables. I think every guy would say, if he could, he'd say seven days a week or, or twice a day or, you know, something like that, which most of the time is not realistic. I mean, I just don't think that's realistic. Uh, sounds good. I think every guy has these pipe dreams of what it could be and all that kind of stuff. But realistically, what is going to work for both of you? Mm -hmm. And and then make that the best ever. If you're a guy and you want five times a week and you guys settle on two or three, make those two or three awesome. Just don't sit around and pout because you didn't get five days a week. Mm -hmm. Enjoy what you have and respect each other in in the communication they're giving there. If your wife is, is you know, if you've got four kids and she's running ragged all the time and she is barely makes it to bed without falling asleep before she gets to bed, you know, you're going to have to figure out some things that work for her. And maybe you do a weekend getaway to jumpstart that again. But again, don't look to your neighbor's or your friends, or anybody else, if you talk to other guys, most of them are going to lie anyway, honestly, unless they're, you're in a really a accountability group with somebody. And so don't look at somebody else's normal. Look at what's your normal. 
Yeah, that's good. That is good. Good advice. I think, yeah, I agree. Just talking to, you know, we get a lot of people who message Awesome Marriage, and then we've just, Dylan and I, administering a couple. They share a lot of things with us, um, yeah. and they have shared a lot of things. And I will say, like, from the abundance of people that I have talked to, there is no such thing as a normal. I know people who have sex once a week, and I know couples who have sex four times a week. And um, I, I was laughing a little bit when you were sharing, like, about like expectations before you get married. I knew a girl who thought the, in premarital counseling, she told the premarital counselor, like they were like, how much do you expect to have sex when you like get married? And she was like, I don't know, maybe like three or four times a day. And I was like, girl, <laughs> <laughs> who has time to be naked that much? <laughs> That's not going to well, happen. No, you, you it didn't never, happen. <laughs> that, you could never dress. I mean, <laughs> it just wouldn't be worth it. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And so oh. It didn't happen, but it was like a very cute moment in a story. And they, well, they my, figured out a good I, rhythm when they got married. My expectation on our honeymoon was sex three times a day. Yeah. And I'm never going to say what happened, but yeah, th that that was I had not I didn't let me say this I didn't communicate that to Nancy mm. before the honeymoon. Yeah, but our and sex you, life was great on our honeymoon. Yes, yeah, and you got to think about the semantics of that too. Of just like this is a new thing and pain, and that's a lot. Yeah, you got, exactly. <laughs> things that you don't think about, you know. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So yeah, there's no such thing. I will say though, when it comes to frequency, um, that it is important to have sex frequently um yes. like and well i guess regular is what i should say i think it's important to have sex regularly um and i think once a month is not regular um so i think once a week as a minimum is a really good place to start unless there's some extreme like ex like extreme circumstance or something that's really preventing you from doing that yeah i was when i was growing up my dad owned supermarkets and i worked for him and so one summer i was working in the produce department and there was an older retired guy that worked maybe he was working part-time there and he was probably 80 82 at that time and but saturday night every week was the night that he and mom he took mom out to dinner and then they had sex and he the look on his face as it got closer to five o'clock on saturday afternoon i still remember him to me i thought that is the coolest thing in the world this guy is 80 years old, his wife is 80 years old, and they are still romancing and having sex. And I thought that is just so cool. And yeah. so they found out what worked for them in that season of life, and they did it. And he couldn't have been happier. Yeah, that's good. That's sweet. Um, so next question, is there such thing as too much sex when trying to conceive? I think the, sometimes what I see happen when we're trying to conceive, it becomes a job. And I, I know that's kind of, or a, you know, and... <laughs> The possibilities get greater, I guess, to get pregnant the more we do, and we do ramp it up in those times. But I guess it's, um, I want you, I think you still need to enjoy it. It still needs to be, uh, yes, you do have more of a purpose there besides just um, enjoying it together. But in the big picture, too, God knows when you're going to have a child. You know, I mean, He has it already planned out. He tells us that in the Bible. And so um, I, th I don't, I, I don't know, from a woman's perspective, how would you say? I, I think it's hard for a guy to say too much sex because I think a guy, it's hard for us to think that we could have too much sex. Yeah, that's true. I think as from a woman's perspective, just like purely practically speaking, like according to my OBGYN, because I asked when we were trying to conceive um, and babycenter.com because I fact checked, um, there's no such thing as too much sex as far as conceiving goes. Um, so as far as that goes, like the physical part of it and like trying to get pregnant, like having too much sex is not going to prevent you from getting pregnant. Yeah. Um, however, there, I do think there can be too much sex for a couple. If one of you or one or both of you is stressed by it or exhausted by it. So I think the important thing to do is to talk about it ahead of time and, and also tell your spouse to be honest with you throughout the whole process. So if one of you starts to feel like this is too much, you both have to have the honesty policy of being able to say like, oof, like I need a break, like not tonight or not this week or whatever it is. Um, just being honest with each other, I think is the key there. I agree. And I, and of course we know that a woman trying to get pregnant, stress does not help. You know, and so the more you can, you know, what what we would, had dad, we had a little chart. And so we both kind of knew when there was the right time and everything. And we just, we didn't really talk about how much we just, we just did. And I think there, it, there was not stress on it that way. Just, we mm -hmm. tried to let it evolve, but, you know, obviously for your first child, when you're not having to deal with other children, you can probably have sex more. You can be more flexible with it and you have to be more, maybe a little intentional with the others. Yeah, definitely. Um, next question. How do you go about having the conversation about wanting more sex in marriage? Most people have had fights over that. 
And so I think you want to clear the air of that. You want to you want to apologize for past conversations and arguments, those things and say, hey, let's have a new start talking about this. Talk to each other, listen to each other, and then together come together and set a goal that's a win for your marriage, for both of you. And I think if if you understand each other, usually we fight about that when we're upset or we, we it ends up being a fight. It doesn't become a conversation. So you want it to become a conversation. So yeah saying, Hey, let's talk about this. I know we've blown it in the past. I've certainly blown it. I put pressure on you. I've said things to manipulate you, whatever it is that's gone on. Let's, let's talk about, I really would like us to, we're having sex once a month. I would really like us to, to try to have sex once a week. Can we work on that together? Yeah, that's good. That's good advice. I think, you know, our, we have a resource that's called our love making survey. Um, it might be a good way to kind of enter that conversation. So the love making survey is 55 detailed questions all about your sex life. Um, and I agree with Dr. Kim. I think you have to be honest and have open conversations with your spouse. But I think the good part about this survey, um, is it kind of takes some of the pressure off of you because you're just answering questions on a page. Like you're blaming awesome marriage. Like blame me. I wrote the resource, you know, um, for these questions and your job is just to both of you fill it out um, and then and then discuss your answers. And I think maybe it would even reveal like what's going on with your spouse that's not giving you as much sex as you want. Like you might be able to find out maybe why that is um, when when they answer their frequency questions. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, obviously, hopefully you guys will be able to make some changes accordingly based on any of those results. Um, but it's just a really detailed survey that could help. That's good. Yeah, it's a great it's a great tool. Yeah. Um, next question. How do you last longer as a male? That's a great question. Every, and every man probably wants an answer to that. Yeah. I you're think, not alone. We get a no, lot of, I will no. say that like, you're not alone. We get so many DMS about this on a regular basis. Um, and, and partly because I think a lot of people feel more comfortable asking it online. Um, but this is a super, super normal thing. Yeah, I think it is. And I think, um, uh, I think the younger you are as a guy, usually premature ejaculation is going to be more common. I think there's, there's some techniques, I mean, of distraction and not think about things. I think there's some medications that can help if you didn't really talk to your urologist about it. Uh, there's, there, there's some wipes that you can use on the male beforehand that's supposed to kind of numb you. Honestly, we tried that and numb Nancy too. So it didn't work. You know, yeah. it just was, mm -hmm. a, it was something you kind of threw out. I, I think one thing is, is it's not that there's not shame in it. I think that's mm -hmm. important for guys to know that that's something that most guys deal with to some extent. I think it's something that you work on together. And I think you talk about it. Are there things in the actual sex act that contribute to not being able to last as long? And so you work together to minimize that because I, the, goes back to the, what a guy really wants to do is please his wife. Mm -hmm. I mean that, yes, we want our own orgasm, but we want to please them. And so the longer that you can hold off or you can do something else to make sure she has satisfaction, that's going to be the goal. And I, I know a lot of couples that once they do that, then it's not as big an issue if the guy uh, prematurely ejaculates. And so I think it, it's, again, it's something you work on together. Don't feel better. Don't be able, don't feel shameful about it. Um, I think it, with my experiences with age, it gets easier to control and, and for, what, for whatever reason. Uh, but I, again, I think it's something we work on together and, and don't buy into some weird thing. Yeah, what, definitely. Whatever, whatever that yeah. would be, you know. Yeah, I'm not going to pretend to be able to speak into this because I'm not a male. Um, <laughs> but I will say you, you're married to one. I'm married to one. Um, but I will say I think one thing to think about. I think uh, our culture. And like you've heard in movies, I did growing up anyways, it, like that was always the goal is like a man who can last long. Like there's yeah. song, there are hip hop songs written about this. Like it's a whole thing. And so I think that can put a lot of like unnecessary pressure on you, especially when Absolutely. you're not. So most women are not going to orgasm during sex. In fact, I don't, I don't know any women who orgasm like during actual sex, unless you're doing something else during sex too. Um, and so I think there's a lot of pressure to like have a really long sexual intercourse, which is always so curious to me because I mean, if you, if that's a, just a normal goal for you, like that's fine but if that's what you want to do. But it's, it's just so curious to me because if you're placing your wife first, like, does it really matter when you orgasm? Right. 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 And I, th but I think there's this like, un like this unspoken about like pressure that like you're bad at sex if you can't last long, but it's like, well, if you've already pleased your wife, like, you're good at sex. You figured out what yeah. works for her. You did it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think so. And uh, yeah, I don't know far, how far I would go with this, yeah. but I'll go a little farther. I mean, I, I've had a couples that would say the wife said, I have trouble orgasming unless there's penetration. Mm. And so they had to figure out some things. And I think one couple, it was really, he didn't move and she did and it worked for him. Okay. So, and she was able to have, or she wanted to have orgasm with penetration. And so that, so I think it goes back to working on it together, mm. experiment together, try some things. Okay. Let's, try this and maybe you go back to, okay, yes, I'm going to make sure you're pleased first. And then, and even, and even if you do that, you can still work a little bit on, on lasting longer. Sure. Certainly. You know, and, and just it, again, it's communicating on it. Yeah, for sure. And being willing to, to take the time and effort to work on it. Yeah. And I guess not being afraid to talk to safe people about it. Uh, so like, obviously like other couples are going to have experienced other things. And so is there a close friend that you could talk to that you trust? Could you talk to your pastor about it? Um, or someone else at church on staff? Could you go see a marriage Christian counselor who's heard, you know, Dr. Kim has heard it all when it comes to sex. Like if, yep. you, like, if you want sex advice, like you should book an appointment with Dr. <laughs> Kim. Um, and so, but other marriage counselors in, that are local to your city too, for everyone who's listening, like are going to have that same experience because people come to them with their sex problems. So yep. they, They've heard a lot of things and yeah. so they have a lot of ideas of different things you could try absolutely and so many times a couple say we've never talked about our sex life to anyone before wow. and it makes such a difference when you do because there's always an answer i've mm -hmm. never had a couple that we couldn't figure out an answer for mm. well there you go that's super helpful yep. um so next question how should i start talking to my kids about sex uh I think you start rarely with why boys and girls are different. There's the learning about sex series. It's an illustrated. I think the first one's ages three to five. You can get a, you can order it online. You can get it at a Christian bookstore, but I think just helping them beginning to, and I think for most parents having a tool helps like a book. And so if you're doing a three to five year old one, it's just little drawings of boys and girls and not, explicit at all things like that you've kind of opened the door and then you go to the next book and so you open the door to it's comfortable to talk to mom or dad or both about sex and so then when it gets they get a little bit older and you're talking more specific about things you've already laid the groundwork so i don't think it's so much them that say when when should i start as opposed to how should i start when i think you start as early as you can and yeah. just that acknowledge those differences because they're curious you know they're gonna figure that out and, um, and so then, but I think really, and so say you haven't done it and say you've got a 10 year old. Okay. Uh, whew, that's hard but, or 11 year old, or maybe your daughter is just starting, you know, start a period or whatever it is, you know, and there's development changes and that's always hard for kids because they happen at different times. And some boys and girls both develop a little quicker than others. So I, I think it is just, uh, I think the couple I've seen, one of the things I think really works is to have a getaway. So the mom takes the daughter and you go and do it overnight somewhere. Maybe you just do it in a local hotel or something like that. But the goal is just to talk about that. The, guy, the, the dad does that with the son and just gives you some time. And it's going to be awkward. I get that. But again, having um, uh, something to read together. I, I know the um, um, there's some good books and I can't, I'm blanking on the name uh, that you can read together with your kids mm -hmm. or that you, uh, to work on that. But you want to open that door for communication. I wanted my kids to come to me with questions about sex before they went to a friend, before they read it on a bathroom wall or whatever, or in some magazine or something like that. And so you want that door to be open where they come to you. Uh, yeah. And, and that's hard and it takes work to do that, but you start laying that groundwork as early as you can. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the the book series, I think you're talking about the four book series where yeah, you read it at age appropriate times. It's by Brenna Jones. And so we'll we'll link that in the show notes. It's the series that Dylan and I are using for our kiddos. Um, I will say I really like that series. I highly recommend yeah. it. It's four different books and you read them at the different ages for the kids. They have like recommended ages on the front of them. Um, and it's a great starting point. So it's like yes. for me, I'm able to look at those books and like we've read the first one with Finley. And like when I have other conversations or she asks another question, I point back to that same language. Like, and I know like, okay, That's this so is where good. we're at as far as age appropriateness, especially if you're not an educator, I might not be aware. I'm not an educator, you know, um, at least not professionally. And so that's really helpful. I will say 
that because Finley is our oldest, she's six years old right now, we've only read the first book, even though the second book says years five to eight, because Dylan and I have decided that since she's our oldest and she's not asking a lot of questions about sex, um, that we're going to wait till the later age range on, on that book to read it, like till she's at least seven. But one thing I have learned from my friends who have older kids um, is that when you have multiple kids, you have to start having conversations with them younger than you did with your first child. And the reason is because your kids talk to each other, right? And they yep. talk to each other's friends. And so they're going to be around that. Um, and so I definitely expect that we'll we'll read the second book to Roman probably when he's five, even though we're waiting till seven for Finley because he has an older sister and he's going to be around her friends. Um, but here's my my big advice when it comes to this um, is that when it comes to the talk, it, it, it shouldn't be that. It shouldn't be a talk or the talk. It's a lot of conversations yeah. over time. Um, and like Dr. Kim was saying, you want them to come to you with questions. Um, and so... Make sure your kids know that it's okay to ask you questions. It's not a hush-hush topic. Um, it's okay to talk about sex. Um, you want them hearing about sex and God's design for sex from you and not someone that you can't trust. So don't shush them, you know, when they ask sex questions. Um, it's okay to ask them that. We'll talk about that later if they, like, ask right. you at a dinner party or something. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but make sure you come back and answer it. Well, and I think one thing that I see parents you've got to do, too, if they ask you a question, you can't say, are you having sex? You know, yeah. you, you cannot do that. So you've got to tell them mm -hmm. that you can ask me any question. I'm not going to ask you anything else. I'm just going to give you the information you want, because if they feel like they're going to get grilled mm -hmm. on it, they're not going to ask you. That's good advice. That's good advice. But if you want more info on this topic, you can check out um, some of the episodes of the Don't Mom Alone podcast. It's a very good podcast for parents. Um, on episode 328, she talks about this in great detail and gives a lot of other great resources if you're looking for more. Good. Um, next question. What do you do if your husband defrauds you? Um, I'm guessing that this person means like degrades you. I think, uh, actually it was in interesting when I saw this, I went back in King James, the word defraud is used and oh. it's defraud, not when this is King James, which is so hard for me to read defraud, not one another, except it be with consent at a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your inconsistency. Mm. So it's basically what we would say is, is depriving. Uh, when do you d don't deprive your spouse of sex? And mm. the Bible says you're just for a time of fasting and praying. So I think if, if that was where she was coming, the person that was coming from that, that defrauding to them would have meant that my withholding sex from your spouse, mm. which I think sometimes people do for punishment or for all kinds of different reasons. And, uh, um, so which isn't okay. It's not no, no. That. I think if you're going to use, if you're going to defraud each other or deprive each other, it's got to be mutual consent. It's got to be for a time. It's got to have a purpose. And if it is to, for prayer or whatever that is. Um, so that's kind of where I'm thinking the things that degrade you obviously or infidelity and all those kind of things like that. But if your husband is, is withholding sex from you and you haven't agreed on it. Um, that's all right. And I would, yeah. I would say at that point, because he's using that scripture, I would, yeah, I would want to go to counselor that would, that understand scripture could help, help clarify that for them. Um, uh, and you, if you're in a church where it's very, the pastor would uphold that you may need to ask somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, I definitely took it a different way. I took it as like the more the degrading and like degrading you physically. Yeah. So on the off chance that that person was mentioning, yeah. it, it's hard to tell in some of these questions. So I'm right. sorry if we don't get to you, well, I, email I, I, us and we'll, we'll, we'll do another podcast. <laughs> no, I knew that you were going to probably go that. So I tried. I thought, okay, yeah. is there a possibility it's a different way? Yeah, no, I know. I appreciate that. Um, so I guess if, if I'm thinking about like physically degrading you, um, I have a lot of follow-up questions that I wish I could ask and I, I'm really concerned. Um, it's not okay for your husband to physically degrade you or your wife. Um, I would encourage you to seek a local marriage counselor on your own, like go separately um, to explain what's happening so that they can help you decide next steps on, on the severity of the issue. Um, but it's definitely like next steps are definitely going to include setting boundaries. Um, if he can't respect those boundaries, consequences need to Come. And that depending on the severity of that, that might mean separation. Um, your husband or wife, you know, whoever this is, um, she did say in the question, if your husband defrauds you, so wife. Um, but if your husband needs to respect, like he needs to respect your desires in your body. So if he's doing something to your body that you've asked him not to do, that's abuse. 
Absolutely. And so I'm really sorry that that's happening to you. I'm going to say I have already prayed for you. Um, and I pray that you get help and get safe um, and that God convicts him um, so that he can turn around and repent and that you guys can restore things. But truly, um, we can't do the, this question if, if that's the way it is, if that's the way it's worded and meant um, justice in a, in a podcast episode. I'm just really sorry that you're going through that. Um but if you've already said that you don't want him to do something to you physically and he continues to do it, get professional help, get help now. Absolutely. And a marriage certificate does, does not give a man license to do whatever he wants to do with his wife. It's just, that's not biblical. It's not legal. It's just, it's wrong. And you're never going to have what God wants you to have in marriage, let alone your sex relationship mm -hmm. in marriage, if those kind of things are going on. And I think for a woman to know that that is abusive. And she has every right to get help. Yeah, definitely. And it's like what we talked about in last week's episode, all about purity. Um, like that's not honoring God. That's no. not honoring God. You need to honor each other and respect each other's body in order to honor God in marriage. That is holy. De degrading your spouse physically, that is sinful. Absolutely. Yeah. So next question, um, is anal sex okay for Christians, Dr. Kim? <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> I always get the good questions. Okay. So this is, and I kind of wrote some stuff out because I don't want to say this wrong and I don't want to be misconstrued, but I don't see in the Bible anywhere that condemns or even mentions anal sex within the confines of marriage. It does talk about it in other areas, but not in the confines of marriage. So I think that anal sex falls within this mutual consent principle that we see in first Corinthians seven, five. And that is whatever is done sexually should be fully agreed upon between the husband and the wife. Neither husband or wife should be coerced into doing something that he or she is not absolutely comfortable with. If anal sex occurs within the confines of marriage by mutual consent, then there's no clear biblical reason for declaring it to be sin. Mm. Yeah, there you go. Amen. Uh, my crap. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think it's only if you both want to. Um, I know couples who are Christians who have anal sex. I know a lot of couples who don't, but I also know a lot of couples who do. Um, but I think I, that would be the key is the mutual consent, like what you just said, Dr. Yes. Kim. And I also think just a reminder, like it's okay to try something and never do it again. So obviously, I mean, not obviously, but maybe obviously most guys are the ones who are asking for anal sex. Um, and so like as a wife, I, I've, I've heard from Christian wives who are like afraid to do it because they're like, well, are we going to have to do this all the time? It's like, no, like if you want to try it, first of all, you don't have to try it if you don't want to, like right. don't feel pressure to try it. Um, it, like it only if you want to, and if you want to try it and you don't like it, or if it's uncomfortable, or if it's painful, you don't ever have to do it again. Um, and that there, that that's the, the mutual part of this, right. That you yeah. mutually agree. Um, so that's all I would have to say about that. Yeah. I think one of the things I say in premarital is really stay at the comfort level of the one who's least comfortable. And if you do that, you're going to be okay. God yeah. does give us, I think he gives us so much leeway in that, but it goes back to mutual consent that you both have to agree to it. And, and you're right. I think sometimes a wife will say, okay, he really wants to try that. I'll try it. And I think you're right. You can say after that, you can say, let's not do that anymore. Yeah. I just, mm -hmm. no, it was hurt me or painful, or it just didn't, it just didn't, just didn't like it. it. Just, I didn't like it. It didn't draw me close to you. Like, like inter intercourse does. And so, mm -hmm. uh, but again, goes back, talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. All right. In a similar vein is oral sex. Okay. For Christians. I think it's basically the same thing. Yes. I both yeah. agree. And, yeah. uh, and yeah, and if you, you know, and, and I know that uh, I think a lot of people if, know that it's fairly common, but if it's not something that's okay for you guys or you choose not to, that's okay too. I mean, it don't yeah. feel pressured because the other two couples you hang out with have oral sex and you don't, that there's something wrong with you. There's not. It, it's what works for the two of you. Yeah, certainly. That's good. Um, so last question, what do I do if I've been married for years and still don't enjoy sex? What could be wrong? Yeah, I would want to dig deep into this first i would go back to what we talked about some in the last episode and that was on medical is there something medical there that is there something that you know i've had i've had uh, i had a couple probably in the last year or so that she did have some pain in sex and it would get better a little bit but it but she never was able to totally enjoy sex because of that there's the fear of the pain and then it would come back but she'd never gone to a doctor to check it out she went to a doctor can't remember what the procedure, what they did, but it changed it. It changed it mm -hmm. where she didn't have pain anymore. And so uh, first find out, you know, why don't you have 
enjoy sex? Is it something from your past? Is it something that you hadn't dealt with? Did you bring some sexual baggage into marriage that you never dealt with? And so it's put a barrier there in your sex life. Is your spouse not respectful of you? Is there, is your spouse, do you feel like you're being used? I mean, all those kind of things that we talk about in counseling to try to, to, to peel the layers back and figure out, okay, why don't you enjoy this? Because I think there's usually going to be an answer. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think I, I just again, I know I already mentioned it earlier for one of the other questions, but it's relevant. Um, I think another tool that could help with this is our love making survey, yeah. um, just because it might help you diagnose what's actually going on um, and what's kind of standing in the way. So we will link that in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's yeah. good. Uh, well, this has been fun answering everyone's frequently asked questions about sex. Maybe we'll do this again if people submit more questions. It's been uh, a cool conversation. Do you have any final word of advice for our listeners about sex? Well, I think it shows us that there's, there's a lot of questions, a lot of things that go out there. And I think it's something that uh, it's not unusual for a couple to struggle with them one way or the other. Uh, my counsel would be to, to address it. Don't let something go on and on. Uh, address it. Talk about it. Communicate about it. Get counseling if you need to, but don't let a barrier stay there in your sex life. Do everything you can to remove it so you can begin to embrace sex the way God intended for you. Yeah, that is good advice. Well, if you enjoyed this podcast episode, it would be so awesome if you could share it. You can share it on social media and let other couples know about the show. Tag us when you do that. We love seeing what episodes connect with you. And if you're not already signed up for Dr. Kim's Marriage Multiplier email yet, I highly recommend you check it out. It's weekly marriage inspiration uh, straight to your inbox. And each email includes one idea from Dr. Kim, one marriage challenge for you to accomplish that week, one resource to highlight, and one marriage question for you to leave with. So it's a really great way. Way to strengthen your marriage and grow your marriage really easily. So you can check that out in our show notes, or you can uh, check out at, at our website at awesomemarriage.com. As always, uh, if you need anything, you can reach out to us at info at awesomemarriage.com. You can email us there. Have a great day and do something awesome for your marriage today.